إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشي الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين الله رمائز أس يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون You who believe be mindful of Allah as is his due and make sure you devote yourselves to him to your dying moment إن الله رمائز أس يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا you be mindful of your lord who created you from a single soul and from it created its mate and from the pair of them spread countless men and women far and wide be mindful of allah in whose name you make requests of one another beware of severing the ties of kinship Allah is always watching over you. And Allah reminds us, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqu allaha wa qulu qawlan sadeeda yuslih lakum a'malakum wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum wa may yuti allaha wa rasoola faqad faaza fawzan azeema. Believers, be mindful of Allah. Speak in a direct fashion and to good purpose. And He will put your deeds right for you and forgive you your sins. Whoever obeys Allah and His Messenger will truly achieve a great triumph. In my visit with you in November, we explored the reasons why the Prophet ﷺ went to Taif seeking support. And we looked at how the people in Taif, the Banu Thaqif, treated him. And we left him in that, in that um, uh, exploration, making this beautiful dua uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, complaining of his helplessness and of his entire, entire dependence on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I would like to pick up from there to share with you a few things that happened between that point when the Prophet ﷺ made that dua and then his final entry back into Mecca. <coughs> While he was resting in the garden of Qutba, uh, and Shayba ibn Abi Rabi'ah, these were two uh, of the leaders of Banu Abdul Shams, who had a house uh, and a garden, a farm, if you will, in uh, Taif. And when the Prophet ﷺ was driven out of Taif by these uh, children, by the boys throwing stones at him, he had taken refuge in this garden. And this is where he had made that dua. Wallah, to you alone I complain of my weakness, the meagerness of my resources, and my insignificance before men. O most merciful of the merciful, you are the Lord of the weak, and your Lord, or you are my Lord. Into whose hands do you entrust me? To some remote stranger who will ill-treat me, or to an enemy to whom you have granted authority over my affairs. I harbor no fear as long as you are not angry with me. Yet your gracious support would open a broader way and a wider horizon for me. I seek refuge in the light of your face, by which all darkness is illuminated, and the things of this world and the next are set right. So that I do not incur your anger and am not touched by your wrath. Nevertheless, it is your prerogative to admonish as long as you are not satisfied. There is no power, no strength but in you. And the Prophet ﷺ was crying. And he was in tattered clothes, his feet were bleeding, his forehead was bleeding because the children had thrown stones at him. Yeah. And we need to recognize that nothing happened to the Prophet ﷺ. Nothing happened to this appointed prophet, messenger of God, <coughs> but that God destined that for him. But that God put that in his path and brought him through this experience. And the, uh, and the scholars in the Muslim tradition, they look at this incident, you know, and, and let's keep in mind that 
This is the same year in which he has suffered the loss of Abu Talib, who was his political patron, he suffered the loss of his beloved wife, Khadija, who, who was a great support, a great comfort to him uh, in many ways. And, and then he has come to Taif seeking help and he has been rejected again. Right? So think about the beloved of, the, of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the chosen one, Al-Mustafa. Right? And Allah has brought him through this. And the scholars say that Allah brings these prophets through difficulties as a means of purifying them, as a means of strengthening their ultimate reliance on back to God, back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? That when a human being totters, teeters between <coughs> completely giving into Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ultimately completely relying on Allah, on Allah versus relying on what is natural for a human being to do, people who are their, their patrons, who are their helpers, who are their families, who are their community. And this is true about prophets of God as well. They're human beings. At the end of the day, the Quran makes it very clear that these are all human beings. But then Allah takes these human beings that have been appointed by him, <clears throat> puts them through this tremendously difficult experience to reorient their hearts completely to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ is going through right at this moment. That he is making this du dua with tears Acknowledging his utter helplessness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's a great lesson for us. There's a lesson for us in everything that the Prophet has gone through, that, that he has done. There is, the, the lessons I want to extract from us is to see how Allah <coughs> is supporting his Prophet and strengthening him and moving him from one level of utter belief in God to another level. <coughs> so, <coughs> Utbah and Shayba ibn Abi Rabia, they, they watch him from a distance. They see him in a very bad shape. And they feel a little pity for him. So they send their servant, whose name is Adas. They send him with a bunch of grapes to give it to this man. And they know him, they recognize him, of course. And they know that they have been in the forefront of pushing him away, of opposing him, of making life very difficult for him. So Adas approaches him with a bunch of grapes, and he gives it to him, and the Prophet in the most remarkable way, as was the way of the Prophet, he thanks him. And he takes the grape, and then before he eats it, he says, Bismillah. He says, Bismillah. And others hears, the, hears him. And he says, these are words which people in this land do not generally use. Right? So the Prophet is in turn, in his turn, he's surprised by somebody who sort of recognizes Bismillah. He recognized the word Allah, and he converses with him, and they're, of course, talking in Arabic. And in the process, uh, this Adas, he tells him that he's a Christian, <coughs> and that he comes from the city of Nineveh. Right? So the Prophet smiles at him again, and he says, he says to him, you belong <coughs> to the city of the righteous Yunus, son of Mecca. He is my brother, he was a prophet, and so am I. Right? Now, think about the coincidence, because it's not a coincidence. This is not a coincidence, right? This is, was meant to be. This was meant to show to the Prophet wasallam that here you are, you've experienced utter rejection from the Quraysh, you've lost your supporters, You've come looking for support in Taif, as, as would any human being do, right? You have a message, you're trying to express it, and people are opposing it, so you want to find people who will listen to you, who will, who will adopt your message, who will support you. Comes to Taif, he's rejected. And then in the, in the midst of this deep dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that, Ya Allah, if you're not angry with me, I have nothing to fear. This is the dua that he made, this long dua, right? And he was crying. And then Allah sends him this, this, this person who is apparently a slave of Atba and Shayba and Dabiya. And he gives him some fruit, gives him some relief, and they have a conversation. And then this person tells him who he is, his story. Right? And then the Prophet says, yes, yes, uh, I know the city you are from. 
and you're from the city of Yunus, who's my brother. And he was a prophet, and I have a prophet. So Adas recognizes someone. He recognizes Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he kisses his hand, and he kisses his forehead. And he comforts him. And the significance is that for the second time the Prophet has received support, emotional support, acknowledgement from people he didn't expect to support him or acknowledge him. Right? This is the second time a Christian, a person, of Christian background has come and supported him. The first one, of course, being the king of Abyssinia, uh, the Negus, who uh, recognized in the prophet uh, and the awaited prophet. And this person, this Addis, seems also to recognize in the prophet that individual who is awaited, Al Mustafa, the chosen one who is awaited. And so he accepts the prophet. So can you imagine the relief that the Prophet is sent in the midst of this very difficult situation? That he confesses to Allah his helplessness. Right? He asks Allah for help. He says to Allah, if you're not angry with me, I have nothing to fear. And then along comes Adas and recognizes him as a Prophet. So this is a great relief to the Prophet. And this is not an accident. And this is mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to recognize that it is a person who says he is from the town of Yunus alayhi salam. Right? So Allah has revealed either shortly thereafter uh, or very close after this incident. that these verses from Surah Al Anbiya are revealed to the Prophet. After his encounter with Adam. Right? And the fishmaster Jonah, he left in anger and thought we had no power over him. But he cried out in the dark, that is the darkness of the great fish, in the belly of the great fish. There is no God besides you, glory be to you, I was truly wrong. We listened to him and saved him from his distress. That's how we save those who have faith. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the Prophet Sallallahu encounter Adas, and then after he leaves Taif, this is an ayah that is revealed to him amongst or other portions of Surah Al-Anbiya. And there is a great lesson in this for the Prophet Sallallahu right? That Yunus, just like the Prophet, was rejected, and nobody listened to him. They sneered at him, they jeered at him. And Yunus Sallallahu got to a point where he gave up, right? This is, this is the, the story of Yunus Sallallahu and he leaves, he runs away from Nineveh. And then of course he climbs, and we know the story, he climbs the ship and he goes and then the people draw lots and throw Yunus alayhi salam and he is swallowed by the great fish. And then in this darkness, just like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam in five, sitting utterly helpless, in this utterly helpless situation, Yunus alayhi salam turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, says, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntum min al this is the dua that Muslims make when they, when they sense and, and experience great distress. Right? That Allah is the only one who can take us out from our difficulties. And of course Allah puts all of us through difficulties as tests and sometimes as punishment. 
and, and we have the heart and the iman to figure out which one it is. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals this story by Yunus alayhi salam to the Prophet to strengthen him as well. That there are two lessons here for the Prophet. That you will be helped if you call on to Allah and you have already called on to me. And the first help that Allah sent to uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi was this adas, this, this, this slave of Atban uh, Shayba, who gave him comfort, who acknowledged him, who basically accepted him as the Prophet of God, the, the one who is awaited. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fortifies the Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa with a reminder about Yunus, who also had been hurt, had left, and then Allah had saved him, and then he came back. And so this is a message, uh, what is the second message to Muhammad sallallahu That you cannot give up on your tribe of the Quraysh. That you will have to make your way back eventually to, to Quraysh. And you have to go back to the job that you have been appointed and anointed for. Which is to be a guide for your community. Right? So the Prophet had lost, you know, the, the, the Iman goes up and it goes down. Right? The faith in our hearts, and this is the state that the Prophet described it, that this is a mark of faith. Right? This is the mark of faith, that it goes up and then it goes down. That, that, that we, we teeter and totter with our faith in God. Okay? But always going back to Him, always going back to returning to Allah. We will, we will do things to hurt ourselves and then we remember Allah and we go back, we remember God and we go back to Him. And it strengthens our hearts. It strengthens our remembrance of God. So the Prophet ﷺ was strengthened in this way. And then he proceeds and he moves. And there's a second encounter. This is the first encounter with others. But before he reaches back to Mecca, there's a second encounter. He, he leaves and on his way back, he takes a different route back and he stops in the valley called uh, the Valley of Nakhla. And in this Valley of Nakhla, uh, Allah again organizes, arranges another incident for him. And it is, as the Quran testifies, that while he is taking a break and praying and reading the ayat uh, audibly, uh, reading the surah, so reading the Quran audibly, that a group of jinns right, are passing by this valley, this same valley, and they saw to listen to his recitation. And Allah reveals this in Surah Al-Ahqaf as well. وَإِذْ صَرَفْنَا إِلَيْكَ نَفَرًا مِّنَ الْجِنِّ يَسْتَبِعُونَ الْقُرْآنَ فَلَمَّا حَضَرُوهُ قَالُوا انصتوا فَلَمَّا قُضِيَ وَلَّوْا إِلَى قَوْمِهِمْ مُنْذِرِينَ this is in Surah al -Ahqaf. It came to pass that we turned a company of the jinns towards you, Muhammad. And they listened to the recitation of this Quran as they stood by. After hearing it, they exclaimed to each other, listen quietly. When the recitation was finished, they returned to their own kind to warn them. This is in Surah al -Ahqaf. In Surah Al-Jinn, uh, there is yet another uh, narration of the same incident. قُلْ أُوْحِيَا إِلَيَّا أَنَّهُ اسْتَمْعَا نَفَرٌ مِّنَ الْجِنِّ فَقَالُوا إِنَّا سَمِعْنَا قُرْعَانًا عَجَبًا يَهْدِي إِلَى الرُّشْدِ فَآبَنَّا بِهِ وَلَنْ نُشْرِكَ بِرَبِّنَا أَحَدًا وَأَنَّهُ تَعَالَى جَدُّ رَبِّنَا مَتَّخَلَ صَاحِبَةً وَلَا وَلَدًا this is also revealed to the Prophet ﷺ after this encounter. Muhammad say to them, proclaim to everyone, it has been revealed to me that a group of hidden ones, the jinns, heard this Quran being recited. They listened to it and said, we have just heard an amazing presentation. It guided us toward the right direction, so now we believe in it. We will never hold anyone else the equal of our Lord ever again. Exalted is the majesty of our Lord. He hasn't taken any female consort nor any son. Why is this important to the Prophet He's going back to Quraysh. He's going back to a group of people that he knows what? That have rejected him, right? 
because Allah has commanded him, go back, this is your job. He revealed to him the story of Yunus and told him that Yunus had to go back. And he had to, and in the story of Yunus is yet another lesson, that when Yunus salam, went back, what happened? Did the people of Yunus salam, eventually follow him? Yes, they did. And this is again a great reminder to the Prophet that don't give up on your people. Go back to them, remind them again, work with them again, and they will eventually follow you. So when, but, but he doesn't know this. The Prophet ﷺ doesn't know this now. He's been commanded to go back to Quraysh and he's going back. And then he doesn't observe the jinns, but Allah reveals to him that, look, there's a group of these jinns that were passing by, they heard you. And they were inspired by the words that I've revealed to you that you were reading. And they have sworn now to follow that which you have read and which you have revealed. Now when you think of it, about it from the Prophet's point of view, here's a group that, you know, they're unseen. We can't see them, right? Because Allah tells us that jinns exist, we believe, we have utter belief. As part of our code of belief, we believe that there exists in the universe this group of creation called the jinns. But I haven't seen them. I don't think you have encountered them. But Allah tells them that there is a group who has listened to the message that you have been reading, just reciting. And they've listened and they've obeyed. And they're going to go back to their community and remind them and tell them. This is also another huge source of comfort. The Prophet setting him up to recognize that when you keep on this path of obeying Allah, obeying God, <coughs> and bringing the message, no, no matter how difficult it is, that there will come from Places unknown to you, unanticipated by you, people who will follow you, creatures who will follow you. And Surah Rahman had already been revealed by them most, for most of it, in which Allah says, Umar sallaka illa rahmatan lil alameen. That you, Muhammad, have not been sent but as a mercy to all the worlds. And this is a part of the world that we are unaware of, that we don't normally encounter in our lives that the jinns themselves, or a portion of the jinns, have heard the message of the Qur'an, and have remembered their creator, Allah, and have decided to follow this. And in this was great comfort to the Prophet Muhammad <laughs> الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله. So I want to connect this back to what is happening in our communities today. I was remarking last Saturday at the care banquet that we face for the last three election cycles, every federal election cycle, we face a very spiking a set of rhetoric uh, against Muslims, against Islam. And, uh, but, but this season seems to be extra uh, hate-filled. And, and, and we know this one federal presidential candidate said Islam is hate. And for us as Muslims, it's hard to hear that. You know, it's hurtful to hear that. But if we feel that this is a difficult time for Muslims, just like the Prophet received hope, let's recognize other things. It's not just that this one person has said what he has said, which is very hateful and uh, but worth ignoring. But it's also important to recognize that another candidate, who is, who is a pretty leading candidate as well, in October 29th of 2015, at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, he, he said the following. He said, our job is to build a nation in which we all stand together as one people. And you're right, there is a lot of hatred being generated against Muslims in this country. If we are going to stand for anything, we have got to stand together and end all forms of racism. And what's remarkable is that this, this particular candidate, you can, you, 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 I'm sure you know who I'm talking about other candidate from the other party. That he was publicly courageous enough to directly equate Islamophobia to what it really is. Call it out what it really is. It's racism. There's no, no, nothing else but racism. This, this hate of Islam Muslims 
is motivated by nothing other than racism. So it's important to recognize that in the midst of very dark words, there are words that are hopeful as well. Right? And so I invite you, um, we are coming up very close to, to a deadline. I invite you, if you haven't registered, to be a voter, to register. March 28th is the deadline. If there's any one of you who is a citizen but hasn't registered to vote, go register to vote. It's important. <coughs> that's March 28th. That's the deadline a few days away. Uh, people in this, in this uh, organization can help you. You can just go online and register. It takes about 20 minutes or so to register online. Pennsylvania allows online registration. March 28th is a date. The second thing to remember is that Pennsylvania has closed primaries. So you can either vote in the as a Republican or as a Democrat. And so when you register, you have to identify yourself as such because of the nature of how Pennsylvania uh, voting occurs. So go and register, go identify yourself specifically as one or the other. If you ask me after the chutzpah, I can tell you how you should register, uh, no, but not during the chutzpah. Uh, but register and then go vote. The voting is on April 26th, primary voting. And it's important to recognize you know, there is a growing number of American Muslims who are being elected as city and state and even federal positions. And this is important for the maturity and the mainstreaming of Muslims in America. We need to support people who are Muslims, who represent your religious tradition, being in the electoral process and being in the system being decision makers in this country and 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 you have to support them you have to promote them because if your voice is part of the decision making then your interests will be served and of course let us recognize that the interest of Muslims is on the basis of justice and truth not on the basis of partiality and on the basis of a narrow interest, their broad interests. And, 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 and let us keep in mind that when we talk about our values, we have to live our values. When you vote for one or the other candidate, vote on the basis of your values. Not on the basis of short-term gains, but on the basis of longer-term values. And your values are that you want the elder to be taken care of. Your values are that the poor should be taken care of. These are your values as Muslims. Your values are that we should have a wage and, and a, an ability to earn that allows us to live comfortably. That concept is called a living wage. You as Muslims, we as Muslims, should be for a minimum wage that is equivalent to a living wage, where people can earn not $7.25 or $0.75 cents working, and you can't, you can't feed a family, you can't live in a, uh, an apartment, you can't have a car to move from here to there. It's not a living wage. It's not a living wage. What will you support? Will you support the candidate who supports the living wage, which is much higher? It's almost double. It's maybe fifteen dollars per hour. Or will you support the ones who say, no, 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 we don't need this. We need, you know, we need the low wages so that. What what are, what are your values? How do you translate your values in the real life? These are questions you have to ask yourself, and then your vote has to reflect your priorities. They have to reflect your priorities. So I invite you to think about this. You know, Islam, the example of the Prophet, this is not an example enshrined in history, but sitting back there behind us. No, no, this is in front of us. And we have to have the capacity to understand that history, understand the revelation of Allah, and translate it in real life, in our particular context. So I invite you to think about that, and then make the right choice. May Allah guide us all to make those right choices. In Allah, the Malaika, how you salute Allah, the Lord. Now you are the Dina, Allah, the Lord, 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 فبعد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإنتاء القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذبكم لعلكم تذكرون وقل الصلاة